So, I get the floor quickly over to Fahad. And uh, very curious about what this is. Memory forensics. Thank you. How much time do I have? You've got. Oh, you actually have until uh, uh, two thirty. Yeah. So it's. So I've oh. got uh, seven more minutes. That's you have some more minutes. Yeah. Like you wanted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Fahad Desan, and uh, I'm a cybersecurity researcher, and I'm going to be talking about memory forensics and security analytics, detecting unknown malware. A lot of, a lot of wordy, uh, uh, strong words here. So uh, a little bit about myself. I, I'm based out of Singapore. Um, I work with the UBS uh, AG, it's a Swiss bank. Uh, and I work with, the, with the, they're one of the teams uh, in security research and analytics. Uh, let me just get started with this. OK. Can anybody tell me what this is? I know this is a map from Google, but uh, what do you see? Can anybody tell me what, what is the significance? Some, it might seem meaningful to somebody. Does anybody have any idea? Any guesses? OK. Okay. Basically, this is a location where it is alleged that one of the mass affecting first one of the first mass affecting malware was created. It's basically a location in. Uh, it's it's obviously the name says BrainNet. BrainNet is an ISP in 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 Pakistan, and this company was run by two people. This company is still in business. And uh, they they created a, a, a malware, which was affecting a 3.5 inch, uh, I'm sorry, 5.5 inch uh, floppy disk. And what what this malware did was, it wrote in the master boot record of the of the uh, of the of the of the disk this message. So th obviously this is talking about their their address, their uh, they what what they did and the, uh, I mean, what, their names and what year was it? But more interestingly, this this malware was not designed to do anything uh, negative or steal some information. Basically, they were trying to propagate a message. As you know, piracy is a big problem around the world, and it's a big problem in Pakistan. And uh, so they were trying to actually propagate that message that do, they had a software which they were trying to sell, and they were pirated copies in the market. So they were trying to propagate this message through this malware. Uh, so, so that's why they say, contact us for vac vaccination. This, this, this place is also impo very important to me, because this place is not very far from my house. In fact. I used to go into the this 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 this, uh, this ground above the uh, park or, uh, opposite the place. I used to go there very often with my family to have fun, um, uh, and it, I was quite young uh, at, at that time, and I had no idea that the first malware was actually created here, and it's called brain brain virus. You can read more, read more about this uh, brain virus in in, in this F Secure website. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I had no idea that it was it was here, and uh, it, it, it's it sounds of sort of you know amazing to me that you know I I, I was quite near there when, when, and I've been to the place and it's quite you no know, nondescript. They are still in business, uh, but it, I found it quite interesting. Yeah. So this was way back in 1986. Let's see what is happening today. So I put in the put up the World Cup logo. Uh, just to signify that this is this is this is very recent and it, it affects Brazil. What this is talking about is a malware called Boleto uh, uh, or, or Bol Bolware. So Boleto is a service in Brazil which is provided by the banks. So it's sort of an on-demand on-demand 
on-demand uh, kind of uh, invoicing or payment. So in, in, instead of you giving the payment, the, uh, uh, an invoice gets generated by the by the by the by the by, by the party which is demanding the money, and that is there is an authentication mechanism with, within the banking system they have. So and and then you can transfer money through this bulato. So it's similar to credit card, but they have their local system. So it is restricted to Brazil. So what? So in, in 2014, a malware was detected, which, which is perpetrated that it costed the Brazilian economy 3.75 billion, and, and it is still counting. They're still counting. They're still seeing variations of this malware. Uh, so I have list, I've listed down what, what, what are the key, key uh, features of this malware. So it, it has up till now, according to RSA research paper, again, you can, you can read about more about this. This is a research paper by, by RSA. It has impacted almost 200,000 unique IPs, uh, unknown number of users. Uh, uh, it impacts all, all browsers. And uh, the, the reason why it impacts all browsers is because of the way the, the malware is designed. Uh, it creates a dummy. Avast uh, service executable, and it, 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 it has all the signatures of a, of a traditional malware, and it, 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 at the end of the day, it is a man in the browser, which is well understood. Why I'm sharing all of this with you? When I read through these news articles or research papers, I'm, I'm wondering, as a researcher, why the hell are we still having this problem? Why are we still encountering these malwares which are having you know, massive impact on people's lives. This is real money. These are normal people like you and me who are losing this money. This is not like big corporations who are, who are losing their money. This is people's hard-earned money, which is being lost to, to people who want to put harm. And the techniques which are being used in this malware are very well understood. You have probably tens, tens or, or not even hundreds of these malwares which, which, which are using this. Man in the browser is a well understood technique, believe me. What it is doing is why all of these malware, why all of these browsers are being impacted is because it is using uh, well understood Microsoft internet calls. For example, launch a, I want to connect to the internet browser, uh, internet, give me, a, give, me a, give me a connection. So that is all underlying on the OS level. That is why the malware, when the malware injects itself into those kind of DLL layers and drivers, uh, no brow browser is safe. So the perception that Chrome is better than, uh, than Firefox or the other way around, or it is better than Internet Explorer, that's out of the window. Again, going back to the, going, going back to the point, why, why are these attacks still happening? I don't have an answer for this. But I wanted to, I, I, I started this journey of finding out what is actually happening and how eventually can, can we find a solution. Is there a real solution to this problem? I don't know. We'll find out. But one thing is very clear to me, that the vendor-provided products nowadays are not working. Or in many cases, they are failing. They are not working how they are advertised. If they were working as advertised, we wouldn't have these kind of, or whatever, whatever may happen in the future, we wouldn't have those kind of cases. And people are losing significant amount of money. So this is, this is quite troublesome, and I want to know I want to find out why. And I will share my journey with you guys today. So by the end of today, you, I'm, I'm hope that you, know, you will learn something new. And, and, and perhaps we can, we, can, we can together find a solution to this problem. So this is my agenda. Talk about unknown malware, memory forensics, IOCs and threat intelligence, what the hell is security analytics. And I will share with, with you a solution which I came up with, a POC work, which I think is, is going to, which can help us to detect unknown malware. And I'm going to end with Q&A, obviously. So what is unknown, um, what is unknown malware? The definition is, I have tried to put it as, 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 as easy to understand as possible. So all malware is unknown. At, 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 at a given, at, at, at some point, point of its life. For example, a malware, gets published by a, by, a, by, a, uh, by a person who wants to take advantage of people, and somebody finds it. A vendor, a vendor finds it, somebody reports it, and that gets turned into a signature. So by the time from which it was unknown to the, to, to the public, 
it is called unknown malware. Some people call refer to it as zero day vulnerabilities. In fact, this is zero day vulnerability. Zero day vulnerability is something where no patch is available. In fact, zero day is something which is already known, but there is no patch available for it. But unknown malware is something which is not known to anybody, and people are trying to take advantage of that. Uh, and the bottleneck, as I said, is the time taken by somebody to report it. The human factor is the limiting factor in this. The, 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 the mechanisms, the way we have today's reporting or, or the vendor research, that is the time taken. So it could be the case that there's a malware which goes out, spreads out like wildfire, and it, it has already caught, uh, started causing you know, uh, huge losses to people or uh, uh, theft of information, but we don't know. We will only get to know when somebody reports it to us. And that, that we have seen it time after time. A good example is Stuxnet. Stuxnet, for those people who know about Stuxnet, this is a very, very targeted, specific attack, which was designed to dis destroy Iran's centrifuging systems. It was designed to, design to an extent where they knew what, what was the model of the centrifuging system being used. It was a semen model, Siemens, uh, a, a, a centrifuging system designed by Siemens, and the malware, what it was designed to do is just change the um, rounds per meter per, per, per minute for that. In, for example, if the, if, the, if the capacity for the centrifuging system was 1,000 rounds per minute, they just change it to 2,000. And the end result was self-destruction. So all the, all the centrifuging uh, machines within uh, Iran's uh, facilities, they were, they, they were self-destruct. They, they were destroyed. As I said, zero day vulnerabilities, and there is, as we all know, there is zero zero protection against them because that's and that's why they're called zero day because no nobody knows how to fix them. And again, the same going back to the question: How long are we going to accept this? This has been going on for too long, so we need mechanisms. We need, you know, something different. We cannot trust what we are seeing today. So here we are. This is today's. Uh, Today's tools, the so-called advanced malware detection tools or network forensics tools we have uh, available. And you see, most of these tools, again, I will not go to in each of them, most of the, these tools are based on signatures, IOCs, or heuristics. These are, again, very, very static things. IOC is something which is, We'll discuss it later as well. IOC is something which is which is happening, which is not verified, which is like an experimental thing, which some based on a threat information which we are getting, and that is converted into IOC. All of these technologies are based on vendor-provided signatures. So, if there is a threat, emerging threat, which is which is affecting everybody else, and you want to feel secure, first thing you do, ask the vendor, "Hey, am I safe?" They say, "Oh, let me check." Next day, if you find out that you were already hacked or some of your systems were impacted, wh what is the answer generally? Oh, sorry. You know, there was a little bit of delay, but the impact is already done. You know, you, we have seen it time after time. You talk about um, RSA, RSA attack. I know it's a patching. Pa it was a patch information, a pa patching related issue, but the end result is the same. The system should have been able to protect those incidents. We have seen recently PayPal. We have seen. Uh, uh, recently, uh, in fact, a few days ago, Finn Fisher by uh, WikiLeaks. Again, that is impacting thousands of machines right now. Why, why, are, why do we have these scenarios? Ask the vendors. I don't know. But this is the, the scenario what we have today. So these are all traditional, well-understood well technologies. So th there is a new breed of breed of technology which has evolved or which has been evolving over the past uh, you know f five or ten years which is called the category is called on host forensics so basically these are uh, advanced piece of software which monitor what is actually happening on your machine and they 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 tr tr trying to keep track of how how they are how they are what is actually residing in the memory or what is happening in the hard disk and they correlate information from other sources for example network information and try to understand what is actually transpiring on a, on a given machine and try to find out any um, anomalies which which might be happening on on the on the machine and based on that they detect uh, 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 you know try to detect uh, malware so it's a it's a 
relatively uh, I said different technique. So we are we are going to focus on this. There are already some products. Mandiant Redline, Carbon Black, and Case eDiscovery. Each of them have their limitations. They they claim to be very advanced, uh, and and uh, no doubt they're they're fairly advanced. But in my opinion, there is still a lot of work to be done, and I will share with you later wh what I mean by that. So before I talk about memory forensics, I think we need to. I'll just spend some time on this maybe less than 2 minutes on this what is memory forensics memory forensics is the is a, is a forensic analysis of what is residing in the memory so that means any artifact residing in the memory you 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 would like to know w what it is and traditionally memory analysis is done with with the help of some tools first step always with memory forensics is that you dump the memory uh once you, why do you want to dump the memory? Because if you try to interact with the memory on a live system, the, the malware might be designed to protect itself and delete. In many cases, we have seen that malware is now nowadays malwares are so um, advanced and intelligent that they, if they see a, a given process or a tool loaded in the memory, they will try to hide their tracks. So, with that kind of uh, thing in mind, you cannot trust. Uh, you cannot load live tools in the memory. And that's why the, the technique is uh, to dump the memory from the live system, identify artifacts, analyze them, forensically analyze them, try to find out, piece the piece, the, uh, uh, um, try to understand what are the pieces of information which you need, and come up with a story, what, what could have happened. Uh, memory forensics is a well understood technique, especially for incident response. So people who are doing incident response or work in SOC, they, they would be aware of this. Uh, the finding can be useful. They can be, for example, when you, when you do memory forensics, the learnings can be put into, for example, a snort signature in any other, any other way you want to do mitigation control or turn off services. So it can be used for that. Um, it can also be used to build up your own inventory of, 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 of known malware, and eventually you can convert those into IOCs, and, and other tools can, can, can use that same information. I have already delved into this, how, how, how memory forensics tools work. Um, the, the, the premise of this is that in most cases, a malware leaves uh, traces of information in the memory. People who do uh, memory, uh, uh, malware reverse engineering, they will be familiar that how tough it is to actually analyze a malware, go through code, whether it's a static analysis or dynamic analysis of the code. It takes hours and hours. I've gone through that excruciating process, identifying a, a, a malware through a, a memory rever uh, a malware reverse engineering is not an easy task. So memory forensics is an alternative because it is looking at the after effects once the memory, once the malware has infected a machine. So we are actually trying to look for hard evidence, and memory forensics is is providing us that. Whereas in 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 in, in, in malware reverse engineering, you have to identify what is the encryption algorithm, what what sort of obfuscation is used, what sort of packing algorithm is being used. So a lot of hurdles and takes significant time. Maybe uh, with malware reverse engineering, you can create a create a more accurate picture, but you need to weigh in you know how much time it's going to take you and how memory forensics can benefit in that in those scenarios so memory uh, memory forensics is all about analyzing data artifacts residing in the memory and trying to make sense uh, and perhaps we can as we will see in the future uh, in, in the later slides how we can go about correlating information from memory forensics with other information pieces of information maybe network packet capture maybe uh, other pieces of information for example seam uh, other other pieces. So, <clears throat> so the so it is uh, in short memory forensics tool. Uh, try to forensically analyze file hashes, uh, files residing in the memory connections. So what you name it, whatever resides in the memory, they do and they try to make sense of it and uh, uh, come up with the story. So before I go any further, I want to delve on into this what is threat intelligence again these are very 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 well known buzzwords nowadays data driven security security analytics threat intelligence what what is this so threat intelligence is is one of the one of the i think one of the new areas w w w within security and how to utilize threat intelligence um, 
It is a source of information which provides early warnings which might be applicable to your environment. For example, a threat is emerging. People have started talking about in a in a in a uh, in a forum or a, in an IRC channel. Uh, so uh, uh, you can get if you if you have the resources, you can be, your people can. Re you know, go into those IRC channels and find out that you know the, uh, an attack is actually going to happen into your company. So this kind of thing is threat intelligence. You are actively looking for intelligence which might which might become a big threat and eventually become a become an attack on you. So any any source of a, a, information which provides you early warning is can, can be considered a threat intelligence. This can be uh, a, a cert briefing or a b briefing by FBI or or uh, uh, peer peer reviews or maybe facebook or maybe twitter or whatever may be the source so all of this is is called threat intelligence and again this this maybe people have been doing it for a long long time but now it has a is a name called threat intelligence uh, there are vendors which provide dedicated feeds for threat intelligence and 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 and, and they can customize it for you as well So how we can use threat intelligence with security analytics. So security analytics, before I go any further, security analytics is, in my mind, uh, security analytics is a step towards getting a single point of information or single point of security, uh, uh, what is happening in your environment. So I've talked to a lot of vendors, other, 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 other peers, and everybody has a different v definition of security analytics. It's, it's still a growing area, and in my opinion, that it's going to take us some time, maybe five to 10 years, to get the grip of security analytics. In short, it is a, it is a, it is a struggle to find, to have a single point of view of security, and the source can be anything which can provide you security relevant information. So some of the sources I have put over here, like SIEM, which is very well understood. Uh, so all today's, all logs go already go into SIEM because of regulatory requirement, because of compliance requirements. So this, this infrastructure is already in place. Whereas other security fields, for example, GOIP, um, uh, other sorts of sources of uh, information, for example, uh, who is information, all of that can be in considered as other sources of information. Memory analysis data, which, which I'm talking about today. Uh, honeypot information, again, imagine the, the power you will have that if you can correlate all of this information in a, in a meaningful way. Seem it has been the engine of correlation in the past, but I think the future is security analytics because it, it, will, it is, by design, it has to be powerful enough to cater and to, to, to be able to handle all of this amount of data and produce meaningful results. The threat intelligence, again, again, is one of the sources which should go into this security analytics. <clears throat> Detecting known malware. Uh, again, I've, I've talked about Signature. All of the, vendor, all of the tools, well-understood enterprise toolkits, are based on Signatures. IOC is, is another way of, I would say, it's, it's Signature version 2, because it gives you uh, early information. Some of the vendors might not have verified those findings, but you you, if you make use of, if you want to make use of IFCs, you can do that through. And, and these are these are the advantages of this. But in my mind, this is still still not enough. So both IFCs, because the, the the main limitation is both IFCs and signatures require somebody, some human being, to report on them, and that is the folly. So we need something smarter. So detecting unknown malware. If you if you if you keep the concept of security analytics in mind, and if you want if you want to go about detecting a, a malware like Zeus, you can do that with with, with this set setup in place. So memory forensic uh, sorry security analytics solution should be able to do all of this. So it, it it has it has a large it has a large amount of data store where it is getting data from multiple feeds and it's able to analyze data, you know and uh, map against IOCs, gather results, correlate results with other sources. So it is, it is continuously looking for any anomalies in the system. But in this case, for known malware, it is relying on IOCs to detect that malware. For example, if we, have a, if we talk about the IOC, what would the IOC for Zeus would, would look like? It would be a bunch of registry keys and an IP address. So as soon as a match is found for any of this, is, it will detect as, as a uh, as, as a finding, uh, if you if you go if you want to understand at a very basic level, this is how an antivirus works. So if you want, you can create your own antivirus, which 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 also includes IOCs. So think antivirus, but at a larger scale. 
So what is the, I just talked about IOCs and signatures and the limitations in these. So what is, what is, what, what are we talking about? How can we, how can we make things smarter? So my idea is that we use the concept of baselining. Again, this, this idea is not new. This has existed in, in a lot of systems. You talk about uh, uh, baselining systems, your Unix systems, your, your, all of your standards are based, based, based on the concept of baselining. Uh, so how do we use it for, for detecting unknown malware? So baseline your environment, baselining your environment means concept-wise you baseline everything. You understand what is residing on your host, try to document them down, for example, what processes are, are supposed to be there. So you, when you build a build, or when you deploy a build, you understand, in, you in, in, immediately document it down what is supposed to be running in, in that build. For example, the processes, the executable, the installed software, uh, whatever is supposed to be running in the memory. So, you, so that is your baseline. So and once, once anything changes, once the environment changes, you collect data about that. You compare against the last baseline, look for anomalies, and investigate, feedback the findings into the new baseline. And ba again, the, so the baseline is always evolving. What that would give you is the power to actually f find minor anomalies, and those can be trigger, trigger points for investigating further and eventually finding unknown malware. Uh, I believe without this system in place, there is no way you can detect unknown malware. A lot of vendors are working very hard to to reach towards this, but there are limitations because their products might not be designed with this consideration. So they have to re-architect all of their toolkits. They have to bring in new new tools. They have to build new toolkits in, into into their, uh, their 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 suites. And so the concept is is this the baselining concept. So again, once you have this thing in place, you can do security analytics to do massive historical analysis. And compare instead of comparing one host, you can compare hundreds and thousands of machines at the same time. Imagine if you are doing that, you can already look into patterns, and that is that is that is already saying that if they, if, if for example, if you find an anomaly uh, in 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 100 machines, that is already an indicator that there's something out of the ordinary has happened, and you need to investigate further. And that is where th this tool adds value rather than relying on sandboxing techniques, antivirus, which are, to, in my my opinion, reactive. So this is a more proactive approach towards detecting malware. Again, that, that that's a very valid question. I will I, I will address that later on. Obviously, you need to have a your your internal research and the, and, and and the concept of whitelisting has to be there. So again, once the idea is once you have built up your baselining procedures enough, you should be able you should be prepared to to react to those kind of scenarios effectively. And noise is always there. You talk about seam, there is noise there, right? Right. Right. M maybe we can we can discuss it off when I need to finish this uh, presentation. I apologize for that. <laughs> I'm already crunched for time. Uh, detecting unknown malware. So de detecting unknown malware. So as I said, for 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 using so using detecting unknown malware using memory for uh, m memory analysis data. This is how you can do it. So you you get the artifacts which are residing in in the in the on the host, and you compare it against your last known baseline. And again, as I explained earlier, you can look for anomalies, what is happening. And that would be the trigger point for further investigation. So I, 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 I spent some time understanding how memory forensics can be used into this. I, I, so the tool I used for memory forensics is, is well understood again. Uh, it's well understood, and we, uh, it's called volatility. So I used volatility to do further uh, further analysis on onto this it has built in capability to detect malware uh, it supports linux and and, and other platforms uh, it can help capture uh, uh, iocs as well what is residing in the memory and you can use it to uh, uh, export out a uh, list of uh, processes for example list of connections which are there active connections or closed connections in the in, in the memory and and that is where we are we're going to use uh, use this it can also be used to dump out files if you want to dump out files or executables residing in the memory, so that is its strength. So the solution, my proposed solution is 
this this first step is obviously you need to dump the memory so my proposal is that you dump the memory into a secure partition within the within, within the within the uh, within your uh, host and that is hidden from the user so the user does not get impacted you you run a volatility script to export out the list of processes registry keys connections and drivers the third step which is the most important is that you this the host send all of this data to a central location that is where you would that is your security analytics uh, and db uh, server uh, again you can tune it to send this data every 30 minutes 40 minutes whatever you know you you, you, you your your environment allows you to do so so th th this is the uh, this is the, the the final step in that so quickly i will go i'll sh show you a demo so this is the the client uh, the client specification because of limited resources on my machine i've chosen 1 gigabyte ram uh it's a it, the, the 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 security analytics uh, so, uh, server is running windows 7 with ms sql uh and uh, yeah so it it is actively do the, the host does active memory analysis and sends the data to the central server and the central server does further analysis to detect anomalies um i will just show you a a demo how to detect known malware so basically what we, what i'm showing over here that i already have a image which is impacted by zeus so this is the 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 a memory image which is which has zeus so i i run the uh, the, the, the 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 this is obviously automated i'm just running it to show you guys but this the, i have tested it that it runs on a scheduled basis so imagine running it on a scheduled basis and after it has run it sends the data to the uh, it creates the memory analysis files uh, and 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 it zips up, zips them up and sends it to to the to the central server so in essence it is no different than any other enterprise tool to uh, enterprise tool which sits on the host for example uh, on enterprise tools like ccm um uh, uh, semantic product uh, called ccs or uh, any host mcafee agents all of them work like that they have access to the system and they do some analysis and sync up with the server so over here i i just showed you some example of what the output is like it's a list of all the all the all the uh, memory uh, artifacts so over here when i uh, i have written a parser which actually when the, when the server receives the data it parses the results and puts them into a tabular form so that is the key to this solution so I, i'm just showing you what what the list is look like this is actually the list of all the processes residing on the uh, on the host so this can be the the the, the host does the memory analysis and sends the results and it loads up into a central server over here i'm trying to detect i already have a list of iocs loaded so i'm comparing those results with the with the uh, uh, with the host uh, memory analysis data so ioc mapped against the ioc data and it is showing that this this host is uh, vulnerable to or impacted by uh, um, uh, zeus again all this is done through sql and is, this can be automated if i we talk about shoot this was totally unexpected I'll just run it manually for now. I apologize for that. Let me start from the scratch. So in this case what I'm doing is I am unpacking a malware. So this is a real malware which I don't know anything about. It is called SVC uh, SRVCP. So uh, obviously I put it as a as a as a password protector so that I don't I don't it does not uh, get launched on its own. So I just unpacked it and I'm going to run it on this machine. So as you can see, there is no impact on the machine. It just launches and impacts the machine. Okay. So this is malware where I don't have any IOC about. I don't have any information about. So what I've done is I have. so and i i i launched the memory analysis tool the script it dump, it is dumping the memory now so i have i had i had already taken a a, a previous uh, snapshot of this machine and now i have infected the machine and it is i'm taking another snapshot so right now it is it is launching the 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 memory analysis script and it is do, doing it automatically so once the data has been synced to the back end server 
what I'm showing you now is that two two instances. The, so this, do these two instances, the IDs belong to the same host. So you can see the node name and node one. They were taken 25 minutes apart. So I want to compare. First thing I do, I compare the list of hosts. What is the new new host? Is there any change in the list of the processes? So if I run that, I see that there is a new new process which is called SRVCP, which is a which has a PID process ID of 192. Um, then I do further analysis based on the process. I try to find what are the new sockets. Has there been any change in the sockets? So I run this, and it shows me that two new ports have been opened: 113 and 1320. And on further analysis, and it has a process ID of 192. And I find out about 192. It is obviously this new new executable. Again, this is all indicator that there is something fishy has happened on the machine, and the differential is. So it's all about differential. I'm not doing. Query all, it is doing a differential between the two states. So again, this is the same information. This is the IP, this is the port which it, it, it had opened. And I, I, I tried to find out more about this IP, the destination IP. And I already loaded the, the geo IP which I mentioned earlier. So that will allow me to get more information about this IP. So within the same solution, I can I will know where this IP resides, who is the owner of this, and what is the where, what is the uh, latitude, longitude of this of this IP. So all of this is here. So again, the, the, the malware has infected the machine. The, the destination IP is somewhere in US. The owner is this. And uh, the, the, the state, the location, it has loads of information. So this is a quick way of showing that without knowing anything about the malware, we are able to find useful information, like targeted, uh, ta target IP, and try to find out where, where that IP is. So this is the power of security analytics. I mean, this is how, how the solution uh, is supposed to work. Let me just go back to this. So what are the, what are the pros and cons of this such a solution? Uh, the benefits is obviously when you come up with a customized solution, you you can you the, the you, you you save on a lot of cost because if you go in the market right now and ask for a security analytics solution or even a memory forensic solution which works like this, it is going to cost you a bomb. So the benefit is cost. You can customize it. You have full control. It is based on an open toolkit, so there is active support for that. Uh, it provides vital information, which is the memory artifacts artifacts residing in the memory, which I believe. Other, other generally used uh, enterprise toolkits do not provide you, and they are a very good source of information. So this tool does that. It's obviously open source, which is very flexible. You can script it. It is highly customizable. Uh, it, can be cus it can be integrated into external sources. We discussed threat intelligence, or be it any other vendor-provided source, you can integrate it. Um, com concerns, obviously, can be resource-intensive, consumes P CPU during advanced analysis. Uh, and I've seen it on my own machine. This is a fairly uh, uh, hefty machine. It's its latest uh, uh, Apple machine. But it, st it still struggles when doing memory analysis. Basic analysis analysis of Windows XP, it still struggles. So it just goes to show what are the sort of the challenges which you are facing. And they are the same challenges which the vendor are facing. So the, the point is that it is going to take us some years. The CPU has to get advanced or powerful enough to be able to do active memory analysis. But the solution, as a, the advantage is that you can choose what sort of artifacts you want to dump or you want to look at. So, so this tool still allows you to do some of it. Uh, based on open source tools, the concern, and with limited support. That's obviously a concern with all open source tools. So where do we go from here? We learned today that memory forensics tools can be developed using open source software. If you have a little bit of time and the, the right resources in place, you can build out your own solution instead of relying on vendor-provided products. Obviously, it's going to be it's going to take you some time to to stabilize it. But once it is there, you will you you will see the benefits. Uh, we can we can automate many of the steps involved in memory forensics using volatility and some of the scripting techniques. Uh, and the bottom line, you don't need a fancy solution to get started with finding unknown malware. You know, you can use basic steps, open source tool, tools, some ingenuity and some some open source information which is already readily available and you can you can start doing the search on unknown malware so this is this is a, a, a template by by sans uh, basically they, they according to their methodology of memory analysis you need to identify rogue processes which we just show i showed you that it is possible analyze process and dlls handles this is again all of the same 
process dump uh, sorry the, the 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 volatility analysis it is already there review network artifacts i just showed you that you can do this look for evidence of code injection uh, by by design uh, volatility has this feature available you just need to tame it check for signs of rootkit again th this this is already available what i was not able to show or do was dump suspicious processes and drivers obviously automating it is not easy because the point is that volatility is designed to have an interactive system it is not designed to to use it in an automated way i'm trying to sort of abuse the system uh, i'm not proud of that but w whatever tools i had available I, i was trying to make the best of it so that is the limitation which i have which we have but i'm trying to work through the limitations and see what, what where it takes me again remembering the big picture the big picture is security analytics is a, 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 a an evolving field and in the future we are going to hear a lot about them we are going to, we are going to hear about data driven security threat intelligence so this is this is the picture which brings all of these this together and you are going to hear a lot about this um and i feel that as 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 uh, cpu processing power increases and maturity and and awareness about about uh, about security and analytics increases uh, this is this is the future uh some credit uh, credits uh, lenny zelster he's one of my uh, mentors uh, you can find more about him here uh, jamie levy she's in heavily involved in volatility project uh her, her 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 some of her script helped me get started with this and uh this book if you want to really know about basics of memory analysis or uh memory forensics or um, malware reverse engineering this is a very good resource um uh, malware analysis uh, mal malware analysis cook cookbook that's the end uh questions thank you for hard <laughs>